Okay, so welcome to the second part of my category theory lectures. And I'm, I'm glad that I haven't discouraged everybody from continuing this. So people who are left are probably people who are in love with category theory. This is, this is great. Um, <clears throat> I want to start by talking more philosophical, okay? So it's like we, we study category theory, but we have to know why we study category theory and what it what is category theory bringing to the table? How, how, what kind of understanding it does, right? I started the first part with, with some really philosophical <laughs> introduction, so I want to start the second one as well with, with a little bit different approach, okay? And um, this time I want to talk about uh, these two views of, I don't know, our knowledge, or the universe, our mind, um, I don't know, but th there are these two approaches. One, one is the local approach and one is the global approach. And as, as programmers, we know this under the name of imperative programming. And on the other hand, we'll have Declarative. Declarative programming. What's the difference? The imperative programming is telling the computer what to do. Exactly, right? So, like, take this thing, move it here, multiply it by this, put it in memory, mm, uh, adjust the pointer to the next thing, and so on, right? Um, declarative programming, on the other hand, is closer to, to math. It just says, hey, this is the declaration. This is the definition of thing like uh, factorial function, right? Uh, go and calculate for me factorial of seven, let's say, right? And uh, so this is, this is a nicer approach in the sense because we don't have to work very hard. We just tell the computer what to do, you know, and it figures out the steps, right? Whereas the imperative approach is step by step, right? So it, it turns, so an example, for instance, like declaratively, uh, I would say, you know, uh, uh, we have two functions, G and H, and we say, what's the composition of these functions? G after H, right? So. Uh, let's say it's called F, right? So that, that I would just declare it and, and the compiler knows what I mean exactly, right? Whereas in an imperative language, uh, we would probably say something like F of X, uh, you know, and define it, like, I don't know, some auto, like if in C++, right? We would have to specify that the variables Types equals h. Well, so let's call it y. H of x, right? And then return uh, g of y, right? Something like this. Well, some some type here also, which you know in C plus plus you would have to specify or write a template or whatever, right? So this is, this is really a complicated way of doing this. And, and actually in C++ they have these huge template libraries in which they try to define such things uh, in great detail, right? Uh, we don't like that style very much, but a lot of people do this because of the belief that in many cases, it's true that you know if if you tell the computer exactly what steps to go, you can then be assured that it will take it a certain amount of time rather than much more time, or you know. So so it's more effective in in a, in a way. At least people believe that, right? It's not always true, and and sometimes it's blatantly false. Um, okay, so let me. 
Fix this. Uh, another example uh, is, is uh, you know, in, in imperative programming, we write loops, right? So, like, if we want to go through a certain sequence, we will, we will have some iterator, let's say, or an index, and keep incrementing it and moving to the next place and so on, right? Whereas uh, in declarative programming, uh, we usually use recursion. Right? And recursion is closer to the definition, for instance, if you, if you want to write a recursive definition of factorial, you know, you will say factorial of n equals n times factorial of n minus 1, right? something like that, and maybe you don't forget, you know, let's say the factorial of 1 is equal 1, right? And that's, that's more like a mathematical definition. It just declares that this is what it is. And, and, and then, once you declare it, you can, you can say, well, give me a, a factorial of uh, 7, let's say, right? And lo and behold, the compiler figures out how to calculate this stuff, right? And, uh, and again, you might say, OK, but if I write a loop, instead and say, well, just multiply the numbers starting from 1 to n, do the multiplication, have some kind of accumulator in which you, you keep the, the current result, and so on, you, you know, this will be more efficient, right? Because you know exactly what moves will be made from memory and so on. Uh, but, but in reality, you know, a lot of these uh, recursive definitions uh, are turned by the compiler into fr from the from the declarative way into imperative way. It just like you know, if there is tail recursion, uh, it will replace it with a go to, you know. So it does all this ugly stuff like using go tos, right? We don't like programming like this, but but the compiler can because compiler is has been very well tested and it produces correct code. We hope most cases, right? So, it will change this into tail recursion and will actually produce exactly the same code. So there, there are these two approaches. Uh, I call it local and global, or imperative declarative. And, uh, and they, uh, in most cases, lead to the same result. They produce the same thing. So is this, is this a very general thing? Is it always possible to turn an imperative calculation into declarative and vice versa? And the answer to <clears throat> this question is we don't know. We don't know. And, and this is a really a very interesting question. And, and it's, a, it's a question that actually keeps popping up in uh, various unrelated areas of knowledge. <clears throat> and um, this is something that uh, Richard Feynman uh, describes in uh, one of his books. I, I think uh, you must be joking, Mr. Feynman, or something like that, right? Uh, and he says that he, he had a, a physics teacher. Uh, in school, and uh, it was a very smart uh, teacher, and, and of course Feynman was was a genius, right? So he, he very quickly learned everything, and, and was bored. So this this physics teacher gave him additional uh, tasks to do, and also things to think about and ponder, you know. And, and one of these things that, that he asked him as, a, as, a, as, a, as an open problem was, was of this type. He says, you know, <clears throat> most laws of physics can be described in these two ways, a local version or a global version, right? So is there something, you know, like why is it? And is it always possible? Is every law of physics can, can you describe every law of physics in this way or that way? And what happened is that, uh, I mean, Feynman liked to, to 
to work this way, that he had like a huge number of current problems in his head. You know, and, and he would occasionally just go through these problems and, and see, oh, I have a new idea on this one, I have a new idea on this one. So this is a problem that's been in his head for many, many years, you know, and eventually it led him to formulating uh, quantum electrodynamics and he got a Nobel Prize for that. So, so let me talk a little bit about this, uh, about physics. You know, I like talking about physics, I'm a physicist. Uh, so, so there, there are all these laws of physics that uh, you learn in school, and um, that that are kind of local. You know, they say stuff like, well, in the simplest case, like Newton's laws, right? They they tell you, you know, if if the particle is in this position and this velocity at the moment t, you know, then if a little bit later, it will move a little bit, right? So this is a very like looking through a microscope at, at this particle um, and, and saying this is what will happen infinitesimally close in time, right? And this stuff is uh, usually described using differential equations because differential equations talk about tiny differences, you know, dx is, is like the infinitesimal change in x, dt is an infinitesimal change in time, right? So it says you know, if you want to know what's going to happen infinitesimally into the future, after dt, you know, then give me information about uh, what's happening now, right? And in most cases, what's happening now is described also very locally, right? And in fact, it has to be very local because if if what happens in the next moment, depending on what happens, like uh, what's happening in, at Proxima Centauri right now, you know, that would violate uh, the laws of physics, it would violate special relativity. So because we are looking into the future infinitesimally, we are also looking in space in infinitesimally close, right? So, so we are usually like, you know, I mean, Newton's laws of physics does describe uh, particles, but if you want to describe like a field or, or, or a solid, right, then, then you would say, well, this point in the solid will move depending on, you know, like what's on the immediate right of it, left, up, down, forward, backward, but also infinitesimally, right? So you look at it infinitesimally and, uh, and you calculate what's next. And, and this, we do this, for instance, in, in programming, when, when you program games, right, games physics. There's always, you know, like asteroids. <clears throat> you will, you will have a, a spaceship moving across the screen, right? What, what's the next position? Now, now we are not talking. Delta t actually is not infinitesimal. It's, it's like when one twenty-fifth of a second or something like that, right? But, but it's tiny. So we are saying, oh, okay, in the next moment of time. Uh, its position will be velocity times delta t, and the velocity will change also, it will be acceleration times delta t, and so on, right? And we, we keep solving these equations frame by frame, we get next frame. We don't know where this ship, or the com computer doesn't know where, where is this ship going, you know? We don't know. We just know what it will do in the next moment of time, and that's good enough for us. Right? <clears throat> so we have, we have these things, and we, we, can, we can describe things like Ma Maxwell's equations, for instance, they describe electromagnetic field in exactly in these terms, you know, except that instead of particles, you have fields, right? Uh, this, this thing is, is even, even people do this in, with quantum electrodynamics, which is like the, the quarks, how quarks interact inside a proton or inside a nucleus, you know, they, they will do these uh, uh, calculations on a lattice, which means that they will actually quantize the space into little blocks and will calculate, you know, uh, how this block of space interacts with the next one, its neighborhood, and so on. And sometimes this is the only way to calculate anything, because we don't have closed. Uh, solutions for these equations. <clears throat> and very often, 
the same infinitesimal, infinitesimal approach actually leads to quantization in the sense that we are considering uh, like delta t instead of dt, like we say, well, there is a minimum distance or minimum amount of time, so we just like digitize space, time, everything, right? Okay, so, so this is the, the imperative approach in physics, right? Or differential. But it turns out that there is this other way of doing, and this is something that started, I, I think it started with, with Fermat's law. Uh, this is the same Fermat that came up with the great theorem. Um, and, and, but he also was interested in physics. He, he came up with this idea that, you know, if you want, in, in optics, in optics, right? So what happens if you have you know, point A and point B? Like what path will a ray of light take from point A to point B? Well, we know it takes the uh, straight line, right? Uh, but why? why? Why does it take? Is that because this is the shortest distance between points A and B? So maybe you can take, you know, and, and you can come up with uh, all the equations of optics just by assuming that this is always the shortest path, path between, let's say, the eye and the source of light. Uh, but that's not true. He figured out it's not, that's not what's minimized, not the distance. What's minimized is the time of flight, right? So the, the, the ray will take actually not the shortest path, but the path that takes least time. So, for instance, if this is A, this is B, and part of it is underwater, okay? And in water, uh, as opposed to air or vacuum, um, light moves slower. So, if the ray took the shortest path, it would spend, uh, you know, a, a lot of time in this slow medium, right? So instead, it, it's clever. It will actually go longer in the air and then shorter in, uh, in water. So it wants to spend uh, less time in water because it's slower. And it, w what it does it, is this is the only path that actually minimizes the flight time. For, uh, for, for the ray of, of light, right? And if you do the calculation, you know, and you say this is like theta one, this angle is theta two, you know, by just calculating how long it takes, you get Snell's law, which is sine theta one divided by sine theta two equals V1 to V2, where V1 is the speed of light in this medium and V2 is the speed of light in this medium, okay? So that's, that's really great and, 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 you know, he was thinking about this and, in, in, uh, you know, it's like in optics you have lenses, right? Um, oh, what about reflection, right? I mean, if, so, so if you have a mirror, why does light, why does light go from A to B? using this path and, and well of course it can go straight too right so that's definitely the shortest the, the shortest path and, and the fastest path but but it also can go this way right uh, and if it goes this way then this this angle is, is the same as this angle right so it turns out that if if you compare this path to any path that's near it right so it can go this way or this way this one actually takes the shortest time compared to the neighboring paths, okay? So, so it minimizes locally, right? So among the paths that are around this point, you know, this one is the fastest, right? And, and in some other cases, it can take the longest path, you know? So, the, so it always finds the extreme. 
So why is light doing this? Yeah, nobody knows, right? And you get the same loss. I mean, if you if you do this, you know, you, you can you can like go between the differential equations. Now we know that actually light can be described by Maxwell's equations, electromagnetic field, right? So we can go through this through these Maxwell's equations, and we can derive these the same loss using local approach, or we can go through the global approach. But that's not all. What about mechanics? Okay. In mechanics, it turns out that rather than using uh, Newton's equations, we can also have this global view. Like, a system starts in some initial state, and, uh, and here's the final state. What's the path that this uh, system will take? And it could be a complex system with, you know, like, uh, particles moving around and, and some uh, springs and uh, boundaries and whatever, right? Uh, so it turns out that there is a certain thing that it tries to minimize if we look at this approach rather than looking at differential equations. turns out that it tries to minimize something called an action. So you can, you can uh, derive all of mechanics by the principle of minimum action. And the action is, well, it's an integral over a path that the system takes of, of the Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian is kinetic energy minus potential energy. Right? So, uh, I mean, without going into much detail, uh, it tries to minimize kinetic energy and maximize potential energy, right? To make this as small as possible. Right? If this were a plus, it would be total energy. But it's a minus. Why it's a minus? I don't know. But it is. <laughs> okay? So this action. So for instance, if you look at, you know, here's a mortar. Okay? Somebody is shooting projectiles. Why does the projectile go like this? Okay, can we derive that? Of course, we can do the differential equations and, and do the animation, right, step by step, and we'll, we'll see that, oh, yeah. But if we say this is point A and this is point B, to get from point A to point B, you have to minimize this action. And potential energy is higher the higher you go, right? Because you, you have to lift something, right? So you give it potential energy. So potential energy is bigger here than here. So the projectile is so clever that it tries to spend as much time where the potential is high. And it slows down, so the kinetic energy is small, right? Of course, if it goes too high, then then, then, then uh, what happens is that you get lots of kinetic energy here and here because you have to like, you know, shoot it with much uh, higher velocity. Okay. But this is, this is just the perfect, this is the you know, Goldilocks principle. This is the perfect path that minimizes this action. Okay. So this is, this is the point where, where, where this professor told Feynman, you know, we, we have this description, optics, mechanics, and we have this description there. Why is it so? We don't know, right? And then Feynman, at, uh, you know, thought about it for, for many years, and he was studying quantum mechanics and, and electromagnetism, and he came up with this idea. Okay, so is there... So, so there is something like the action in, in quantum mechanics as well, you know, you can, you can, kinetic energy will be some, you know, differential operator and potential energy will be some kind of function of, uh, of the space coordinates, you know. <laughs> so you can formulate this, but, 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 but you don't really get any trajectories in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, what you get is probabilities. So he came up with this idea, it was revolutionary. You know, what if we, instead of just finding the, the, this 
path of minimum action, we just consider all possible paths. And instead of minimizing it, we'll just add them up. They take all possible paths from, all, from point A to B. Okay? And, uh, and sum up the, the, the equivalent of action, which is actually a complex number. Okay? So you get sort of like an interference because a lot of these paths will, will, will cancel each other because they, one is with a plus, the other with a minus, right? And they cancel each other. But the ones that are closest to the classical path, for instance, they will add up. So a quantum particle prefers to be close to its classical solution, but doesn't have to. So this way of you know, taking all possible paths and summing up, that was, that was a, a revolutionary idea. And this is, you know, the all, all possible paths in quantum mechanics. It, it, it means actually, you know, producing particles out of vacuum and so on. So he came up with these, you know, Feynman diagrams where you have an electron uh, and you have a photon jumping between these two electrons, right? So this is the past. And, and the whole of quantum uh, mechanics the, the relativistic quantum mechanics is described in a way, here's an initial state. Let's say you have two electrons. Here's the final state, two electrons. What's the probability of transition, right? And you have to sum up all these probabilities. You have to like integrate over all possible points here. Uh, what, what about if they like exchange two photons or three photons? Okay, and maybe inside this photon there is like an exchanging of a pair and so on. Sum up all of this stuff and you get the probability. <clears throat> and now I was thinking about this, you know, and <clears throat> when I was reading about uh, neural networks. And it turns out that in neural networks you also have this kind of weird equivalence, the global and, and local. View. I mean, locally looking at neural networks, right? You have a neuron, or the, the element in the neural network, right? It has a bunch of inputs, right? Uh, dendrites, like in the neuron, right? And then there's an axon uh, with, with, with some output. And what it does, it's a local thing, right? It just takes these guys and sums them up with some weights. Right? and outputs this here. And then there's the next layer that takes this input, sums it up, right? So, so there is a next layer. And so on. And you can have many, many layers. So that's a very local approach. And, and in fact, you know, they, they are solving differential equations to backpropagate uh, the, the weights to, to to find. But you can also think of this <clears throat> in a declarative way and say, <clears throat> I have a neural network that recognizes faces. Okay, so there is a neuron at the end which tells me what the probability of, a f of recognizing a face in a picture is. Uh, so it's, it's close to one when it's a face, it's close to zero when there's no face in the picture, right? And there is a bunch of inputs here that are pixels in, in the picture. Right? So, how, how does the impulse here get generated? Well, if you look globally at it, it sums up all possible paths that go here, right? So there are many ways, many paths through, through the neural network, right? It just sums them up. And the sum, you know, some of these paths give you positive, some of them give you negative uh, component in, in here. Sometimes they cancel, you know? It's like, oh, it kind of like one part of it, it kind of looks like a face, and the other says, no, it looks like kind of like, like a truck, right? And, and they cancel each other, right? <clears throat> so there is this global view also in neural networks, right? So, 
it seems like it's not only like there is a law of the universe, but, but maybe there is a, a, a way that we perceive the universe that, that has these two components, the local and global component, right? Because this, this is like appearing in so many different areas. <clears throat> and now I want, I, I want to go back to, to programming and maybe at a, very, a little bit higher level. Like, where, where do we have the, the examples of this kind of declarative problem solving in programming? For instance, when we do ray tracing, right? Ray tracing is uh, like when we when we are doing asteroids. That was a very local approach, right? But if in ray tracing we say, okay, there is a ray coming from the eye and through some pixel, right? And it hits some object and then goes to the light source. Okay, so that's that's more of a global approach than local approach. Right? On the other hand, we do it for every pixel, so that's, that's a local part of it. But there is an even better example, uh, and, and this is in functional programming, right? This is the functional reactive program, which is a completely different way of approaching uh, input-output in a program, right? Or interactive program. Um, and I don't know, I mean, not, it's, it's been described in very technical terms usually, but, but for me, the, the way I understand FRP, Functional Reactive Programming, is that it treats all input as if it were pre-existing. So, instead of thinking, oh, okay, now, now the user moved the mouse or, or clicked or uh, pressed a, a, keyboard, right? Um, and, and we have to react to it and like, like we have to have handlers for it and so on. It thinks, okay, here's a list of all the actions that the user will do. So it sort of like says, you know, I know everything about the universe. I know all the future. This is the list, okay? This is the list of mouse clicks from now till the, to, till the program terminates. This is the list of keys that the user will press. Okay, there, here's a list of uh, input from, from the network that will come while you are working. Okay, here, go and calculate something for me, right? And you just go and take this list and say, okay, well, uh, I can apply a function to a list, right? Like fmap or I can do fold of this list, you know, I can merge two lists, stuff like this, right? And you just work on a whole list, as if it existed. Of course it doesn't exist at the moment when the program is running, but that doesn't matter. You know, it's like if you tell it to, you know, do, do something for every digit of pi, you know, does it have every digit of pi? Well, maybe it reads it from a file, but even when it's reading from a file, it takes time, right? So, or if, if it calculates it, it doesn't have everything at the same time. So it comes sequentially, right? And in a, in a lazy language like, like Haskell, that's great, right? Because, you know, we don't care that we don't have the whole list. Conceptually, we do have the whole list. When time comes to get the next element, okay, maybe we'll block. The system will block waiting for user input, right? But we don't care. We just have a list, and we operate on the whole list. So this is like like the the um, you know pre-established harmony. This is some, something that Leibniz Leibniz liked, and Leibniz actually came up with monads, but not not the, the same monads that we talk in category theory. Right? I, I think Leibniz's monads were more like co-monads because it was point that has information about the rest of the universe. Sort of. okay. And now, back to category theory, okay? So, uh, category theory has inherently this, this global approach to everything, right? I mean, remember how we define, and, and we'll be to talking today about limits, but uh, limits come from, from uh, things like products. 
Uh, so when we were defining products, we used this universal construction, right? And uh, the imperative way of defining a product of two sets is take an element from this set, take an element of this set, and make a pair, right? Very imperative, right? And very local. This set, this set, I'm not looking at the whole universe. I, I just have this set and this set. I don't care about anything else. Whereas in category theory, when we are defining a product, we say, okay, here's one object, one another object. Now let's consider all possible objects that could be candidates for the product. All of them. So every object with two morphisms, two projections, consider all of them. And minimize some things, right? I mean, not really minimizing, but that's saying what's the best one of, of these. So that was the universal construction, right? So category theory is the embodiment of this kind of universal look, this kind of declarative approach. Okay, let's take a break.